Hello, everyone. Thanks for showing up to my talk. Uh, my name is Mikio Braun, and uh, I'm a so-called data scientist. And today I want to talk a bit about new approaches to achieving real-time, which don't just rely on scaling, okay? So, reacting to user behavior. So there's a lot of um, data which is generated these days, and which, which you also use big data for to analyze. Um, and that's actually user data, right? So there's a data user here, he goes to website, and then uh, everything he does there is written into some logs. So this might be page views, when he clicks on something, uh, when he puts something into his, um, into his uh, cart or something. And based on this, right, so you want to analyze it, you crunch the data. And for example, you get out, okay, right now this user is in, uh, interested in cars. Okay, so I could you know, show him an ad for some car maker, or I could you know, recommend him a nice new car, or I can show him articles based on these cars, and then I can feed all these things back to the user so that the, the website is adapting to him and showing him the stuff which is interesting for him, right? So it's, it's a form of a, a conversation with the user. And, uh, and apparently this has to be in real time, right? So if I, if I look for cars now, and then the system, like after an hour, decides, oh, there's someone who's just interested in cars, then maybe I already stopped using the website. So this is somehow, um, yeah. Okay, and then here up, up there, there's also like, these are like items on your website, so all this, this also goes into the database, so there's a whole lot of data in there. Okay, so far so good. Now if you, if you would do this nowadays, right, then usually you would do it maybe like 10 years ago or five years ago, you would do it like this. You collect all your data into a big SQL database, and then you analyze it. And analyzing usually means you do some, you know, some counting over certain time frames, like you take the last month of data, and then for each user, you count how often he has looked at certain categories and stuff like that. And then the result again ends up in a data database, and then if the user is there, uh, you can actually show him the stuff you think he's interested in. But the problem here, of course, is that this takes a lot, long time, right? So if you have several, I don't know, 100,000 users per day, then alone calculating this thing over a whole week will take more time. Also, it won't work that well. So as new data comes in, the database gets even slower. So this is yeah, something we apparently know doesn't work very well. Okay, so maybe like three years ago, you actually do it like this. You don't put it into a SQL database, but instead you just write the logs on your Hadoop cluster, and then you can uh, run a, a MapReduce job to analyze the data and then store the results again in some database, and you can get it out. This is a, like, it, it's an improvement, so at least it's scalable. Uh, but again, these jobs take a long time uh, to run, so probably longer than the user is actually interacting with the website. So then the next thing, so if you do it like this year, maybe you have something, you, you, you switch from this batch-oriented processing to a stream-oriented processing where you process all the events as they come in. So you probably use something like Apache Kafka, which is basically uh, a piece of infrastructure which lets you collect lots of data uh, in, a, in a reliable fashion, and then you would use something like Storm, for example. So this is um, a stream processing framework, which you probably all know, where you can um, process the events as they come in, and you can also scale that out. And then you would probably not use H-based, but some memory-based database like Redis, because it has to be fast, right? So here, at this point now, you're in a position like if you have a lot of money, you can actually get to a point where you can like, see what the user is doing and, uh, and react to it in real time, okay? So far, so good. But the problem is, so there are some problems with this. So one is that um, actually, if there's a lot of data, then this needs to be quite big because, uh, yeah, because like each processing unit and because of all the distribution overhead is actually not that fast. So each of your nodes can process maybe, I don't know, a few hundred, a few thousand events per second, something like this. this um, so basically, it all comes down to this, right? So one does not simply scale into real time. I mean, you can if you have a lot of money, but still the question is whether you should or not. And so in a way, <coughs> um, like so far, all of this big data has been about scaling. So it has been like thinking about how we can break down the stuff we do with our data into pieces of infrastructure, uh, which each 
it individually can scale out, and then you can put them together like this, right? So each of this is a piece of infrastructure. This is for storage, this is for computing, another storage layer. And um, we've sort of like built all this toolbox of stuff. Uh, and if, if we put it together, uh, we can build something which scales, but maybe isn't so fast uh, in, the, in the long run, right? Because, yeah, okay, I, I'll come to the because later on. Okay, so in a way, like usually, when it is, how it usually works in technology is like you're in some field, there is a certain approach, and you optimize this approach and optimize and optimize it until you come to a point where you sort of have, have um, reached like the optimum which you can achieve with a certain kind of approach, and you're basically at a, at a dead end. So I'm not saying big data is at a dead end, right? But this specific approach can only get you that far. And then what's needed, you know, in order to go somewhere else is actually you have to, to, to jump outside of this box. It's not really a box, it's a blob. Uh, you have to jump outside, you know, by looking back at your problem, problem and realizing that there are some things which you've always assumed, which, which are not always true, and that then helps you to move out of that. For example, so before we, we had like this uh, asset compliant databases, right? So the, like the traditional databases with transactions, which were basically uh, designed in a time where you would use them to really like keep track of money and other things. And that was really important that like if like two people are making deposits, then they don't interact and all that kind of stuff. But then as they, as we started to build all these websites based with, on this database technology, it became clear that uh, like not everything here is really necessary. Um, for uh, in particular, people realized that the consistency you don't need strong consistency. So if you, you use your database just to store like user interactions or something, it's okay if some of the users see the results only after 10 minutes or so. So we dropped consistency and we made this jump and came out at the with NoSQL in a similar way. So we all had these laptops, and then like Steve Jobs realized, okay, you don't, for many applications, you don't really need a keyboard, you don't need all this processing power, or you even don't need a file system, right? And then he said, okay, so maybe instead we want something like, which is basically a screen, which, which we can carry around anywhere we go. And then we came up with a new solution, right? So this doesn't solve all the problems which this solves. So in, in a way, it's a, it's a, it's a change, so you've, you lose something, but actually, for some application, it makes a lot of sense to do that, and then you end up with something which is much uh, better fitted than the solution you had before, okay? And in a way, <clears throat> so this is maybe the first main po point of this talk. So the thing for, there are applications out there, and I think uh, user profiling uh, is one of them, uh, a reactant user, where actually, actually exactness is not necessary. So in classical big data, uh, so in particular, these exact aggregates like count and average, which we like, which originally came from the database. You know all these. You know, so you select from a table and you say you want to count, and then you group by on the user, and then you get in the end out how often the user has interacted with your website or something. So these are these basic aggregate operations, and that's that's something we have since the 70s. Okay. <coughs> um, yeah, and they are they are exact, right? In the sense that they really return the number of examples there are. But in a way, they also restrict uh, our abilities to deal with lots of data because for, like, even for events which occur very, not, not very often, you still have to keep that count. So and if you get that, if you, if you lose that, if you say, okay, for my application, it's not necessary, just as you wouldn't use a laptop to surf from your couch, okay? Then you end up with uh, so-called stream mining algorithms, uh, which is a class of approximate algorithms. Um, so, yeah, okay? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about this uh, later on, okay? But just to come back, so, um, right? So this is how it's done right now. Actually, what I'm saying is, if you say, I don't need exact results, you can actually replace all of this with a solution which is much better integrated and fitted and has much higher performance. So this does also work, and there are cases where this is exactly what you need. Um, but if you go this other way, there are solutions which are much simpler, and I'm going to talk about uh, how to do that now. Okay, so just to say, why, why is it that uh, if, you, if you deal with user data, why is it that in many cases you can actually live with having approximate results? And uh, the main reason is that the, like, the activity of users is usually looks something like this. 
So there are a few users who are interacting a lot, and then there are many who just you know, show up once a week or so. And of course, like this is the part where you really want to uh, spend all your computing time and your money to be able to react in real time, because these are the users who are most active, you know, who, who are actually buying things. Whereas these are users, so, right, so it doesn't really make sense to, to have like a whole cluster just store the results, results for these users. Um, or you can just do it in the old way, but then you don't have to speed it up. That, 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 uh, that you don't have to spend so much money to speed it up. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what is stream mining? So stream mining uh, is a class of algorithms which has been developed in the mid-2000s to deal with the questions of answering so-called stream queries with finite resources. So you have an event stream which comes by, and you say you don't have enough memory, so neither, in mem uh, neither uh, like RAM or disk, to store all of the information that's in there, but you're still interested, for example, um, to count how often uh, the items, the different items appear in the stream. Right? So the, if the event streams are users, so you want to know which user has uh, viewed how many web pages, or if the events are web pages, you want to know, uh, like pages on your website, you want to know which page has been viewed how often. And you say, but I, but I only have, so I know there are, like, I have one million users, but I only have one megabyte of RAM to count it. Okay. And this, these, are, these are algorithms which, um, right, so you stream past your data, you, um, you have this analyzer, which has a, only uses boundary resources, and then you get it on the result, which is approximate, but usually comes with a theoretical guarantee, which says, if I have this amount of memory, then the error I'm going to make is smaller than that. So how do these algorithms look like? So luckily, they're actually um, quite easy to understand. So here's an algorithm um, which counts these activities over large item sets, so millions of users, IP addresses, Twitter users, whatever. And the, the algorithm works as follows. So you have a fixed table of counts. So in this case, I say I, have, I only have room for six numbers, okay? And these are the names of the users who came to my website. So and if I have a new user coming by, actually I have two cases. So either he's already in the table, then I just uh, increase his count. So Paul goes from, oh, this is actually Paul, from 12 to 13. Or if it's a user that which was not in there, then I take the, the one which has the least activity in here, and I drop him, but I take his count as a starting point for the new one. And then you can prove that this is the, like the, um, the, the worst case of times that Nico was already in the table, but then I removed him because somebody else showed up, right? So it might be that Nico had been in here, uh, yeah, at most three times, <laughs> in a way. Okay, and then there's a paper, you know, you can, if you want to be interested in the proofs, you can all read all that. But so the interesting thing is, it's actually it's quite a simple algorithm, which um, yeah, which sort of also does its own memory management. So I'm not saying you can you cannot implement this using existing architecture. Okay, it's just uh, you could if you if you wanted to. Another algorithm which you probably heard on is, are these count min sketches, and um, so the algorithm before actually has like a count. So here you really have a list of all the people who were on a website. And um, you can later on go in and say, okay, so tell me who is the user who was here most often. So count min sketches work differently, so you don't actually store the IDs of the things you count. It's only a data structure which you can query. So if I have that user, I can ask, so how often has that user been here? And then I get an approximation for how often he's been there. But I cannot go in and say, okay, tell me who, who is the, like, the most active one. It works like this. Um, so you have a certain number of bins, and then you have a certain number, so you have these n times, m bins, n times, and each row here in this matrix corresponds to a different hash function. And if you have a new entry, you compute for each row the hash functions, and then you count the, the entries to which these different hash functions point, right? So here I have some new entry, I don't know, maybe Nico is coming by again. So here it's the, the third bin, the second, the fourth, and the third and then I count these things up. And when I query it, actually, I, go, I, I do the same thing, but then I take the, um, the, the count, which the smallest count I get in all of those, and that way I'm, I'm minimizing the collisions, right? So another user might also end up counting up this bin here, but I do it like n different times, and therefore I get better and better the more, the more memory I have. Okay, it's a very, again, like a very, uh, um, simple, it's not 
yeah, it's, I say, I'd say it's, it's quite easy to understand how it works. So if you want to implement it, actually it's a bit different, uh, difficult how, how you get n different hash functions, so there are techniques for that. But that's the basic idea here. Right? And this is very good if, if, you, uh, right, if you really only want to query, if you don't want the trend, but you just want to query and you want to have like, a better approximation of all of those. Whereas like in this case, for the smaller ones, the error will usually be quite large. Okay. So counting, we already have like, so instead of doing these average things and counting like in, in SQL, you could use a data structure like this and get approximate counts and not use a lot of memory. Then the other thing but with the SQL count is always that you usually want to have activity over time frame. You want to say, okay, who were the most, which page has been visited most often today? And then you had like this where clause where you, where you bracket the, the timestamps of your events. Um, <clears throat> and that's also something where you can do a, Approximation, right? So if you do this exactly, you really have to keep all the events in there so that you can, you know, go through it. Or if you try to optimize it a bit, then you probably you have a data structure where you put in the event when it occurs, and then you take it out like a, a, a like a day later or a week later. But then you still have to keep all the events in here. Or what you can do is you can like dump the whole table uh, at certain intervals, and then you can look at like what is the count today, what is the count a day ago, and then the difference between those will be the actual number of times this account occurred. So by doing, instead, instead of doing this, you could also do, um, do an exponential decay. That is, so if the count occurs, it starts with one, but then over time it will just decay. Right? And that way, so each time an so, uh, event occurs, and then if no event occurs, the count will just decay. And then when a new one comes, you, you add them up, and then you have a new thing which again decays. Okay, and this is not the same thing as having these exact numbers, but it's again a good approximation over if you uh, use different time scales here, you get different um, uh, yeah, approximations over these count of the time scales. Okay, uh, and there, that sort of gives you like um, a way to very quickly, okay, and the good thing here is you really just need to store the score and the last timestamp you've seen here. So just two numbers per entry. Okay, and you can, you can combine this with this data structure uh, to, to get something where uh, you, have, you automatically have a trend over a certain time scale. So you get the most active users over the time scale you have defined, and that way you, you already um, you get an approximation to the select statement I talked about uh, in the first slide. Okay. <clears throat> um, there's one more thing. So usually, so here, right, it's just... It's just entries, uh, and just sim simple na single names, but it could also be tuples. So it could also be like, not, not, the event is not just that Frank has occurred, but Frank, Frank came uh, from that referrer or something, and he looked at web that website. So you could actually have something where you, the event is not just a single object, but it's actually like a combination of a page, a referrer, and an IP address. And then you count how often this specific com uh, combination has occurred. And then what you can do is you can have secondary indices. So this is already, so it's getting, it's starting to get a bit more complicated. So it's still like the single, the single table with the counts, the bounded table, but you also have like a, a, a binary search tree, like on the side of it, which keeps these thing, uh, uh, sorry, for each of these columns, you have like a, another entry which says, okay, now, and then what you can do is you can say, now give me only the entries which have been referred from Google, or give me only the entries for the index page, okay? And that way you're already getting to a point where you cannot just have one count, but actually you have like a data structure which you can query for all kinds of relationships between your data. Okay, so now using that, right, you can start... To, uh, to store data in a very compact manner to do all kinds of analysis. So for example, if you just want to store like an array in here, so you have counts for x, d, and a. So uh, the counts so x has already been occurred five times, d already two, and a already three. You put them into the strand, and then it's, already, it's automatically sorted. Um, but that way it's also, um, like you can put a whole vector in there, like a whole matrix and whole array, and then the data structure automatically only keeps the, the largest items. Okay, if that's, and if that's what you're interested in, then everything is good. So you can you know, just uh, count stuff over very large scales, and uh, you have something which automatically focuses on the things which are most active. You can extend this, and for example, if you have whole profiles, so for X, for example, 
you not only have one count, but you say, so, some, so X might be a user and A might be some category he had, he's been uh, looking at. So this, he has seen A five times, B one times, C two times, and user Y has seen A eight times and D two times. Right, and then you just sort these, uh, you put these in, and then you get this sorted thing out here, uh, sorted by the, the actual score. Um, and if you then do the query uh, on these uh, column indices, you, you will, uh, you will re uh, reconstruct these, these profiles here. Okay, and then again, if, if you have more prof, more data, then uh, you have um, like a, a memory, then it will start to automatically discard the ones which are very small, and you sort of get an approximation which focuses on the most active ones. Okay. So one more thing. So you can even like store a matrix in there. So like the I's are the uh, the rows and J's are the columns. Um, and if you store it in here, right, you get the so eight is the largest. So I um, I equal three, J equal three, eight is the entry. So three, three, eight. This is just what's stored there. At one, one is the five and so on, and then you can store the sparse matrix in here. And if you sort of like, uh, if you then use the, the indices you have on the columns of this matrix here, you can either get the row. So two would be like, uh, like in the second row you have a two and a one, and in the first row you have the five and the three. Two, what? Oh, I'm up. Okay, no, it's this, it's this column here. Okay, so I'm just saying, so you can, you can actually take a sparse matrix, which is something, you know, you would use to, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to discuss uh, in a minute how, would you, how that occurs in recommendation, but you can also take like a mathematical data structure like that and actually store it in the, one of these tables um, in these data structures, in the stream mining data structures and get an approximation at all time, which never grows in memory, which is always very stable. Okay. <clears throat> So actually, uh, we've built this thing called Stream Drill. You can look at it. There is a demo version you can download, which is uh, exactly a real-time analysis um, engine, which has been built using these data structures. So it's based on a heavy hitters counting exponential decay, as I explained. And you get instant counts and uh, top K results over time windows just by querying the data structure. It's all in memory and written in Scala. Uh, and we also started to um, uh, construct modules based on this which I'm also going to talk about a bit now. So the interesting thing is, so, so people always, when I say, talk about Stream Drill, people always ask me whether you can, can't you just do that in Storm, right? But I think that's the wrong question. So of course we could also have implemented this in Storm, but actually we could just implement these things not using any of the big data infrastructures, but we still ended up with something where we can deal with lots of data and millions of events just on a single machine, you know, without even, without even scaling out. And I think this, that's the... Uh, that sort of shows what the power of this approach is. Okay, so real-time user profiles. So how would you do this? Now, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's quite simple, actually. So, um, like, if the event, is, the event is that the user has looked at a certain category, you have a, a trend which tracks users and categories, and then if you, if you look for a, a certain user using these indices, you get the profile out. Okay, and then if you, so you update the, the, the corresponding combinations here, uh, and just as I, said, as I said before, how you would store profile information, you can just get it out by con consulting these indices, and this doesn't take any additional computation time, you just get it out. And so these would be like for, I don't know, cars, you have that much uh, activity, for video games, you get this, and so on. So we actually have that uh, in production with a, uh, we have a pilot project with a company who does behavioral targeting. So they, they are the ones who follow you over websites and set cookies, and then they analyze the website you look at, and then they build a profile of you. To, um, and then, like, if you, when you show an ad, you can actually say, okay, show me an ad, show this ad only to people who are interested in cars, and something like that. Okay, but so the thing they, the, the system they had was uh, specifically designed to integrate all this information over time so that they get a profile, like a basic profile of you, and it could not deal with these real-time things. But this way, so this, the way this works right now is they have um, a big, about uh, 30 nodes, which uh, on, on each of these nodes run a number of Ruby, Rails on Ruby insta instances, which actually do, do the analysis, and then all these packages, these nodes send by UDP the events uh, to Stream Drill. And then for that, 
Um, for each user, you can get this profile out for the last hour, the last day, the last week, and then you can directly, you know, make the comparison and see, okay, so there is a category here which uh, over the last week or the day wasn't very active, but now it's very active, so this is something which is interesting, which you could use to show him something. Okay, <clears throat> so this looks like this. It's very small. <laughs> so there's a dashboard, uh, but the dashboard is not really like, it's just for us to see whether it's working or not. So this, the real value comes from having a REST interface on the back where you can, within milliseconds for each user, get these profiles and make the decision whether you, there's something you want to show this one or not. So these are the users down here and the activities, and these are these, these fingerprints, um, uh, and these here also show the histograms over the different categories. And for a single user, it can look like this. So these are the categories, chat information, entertainment media, over week, day, and hour, and here are the, uh, the differences in percentage points between those. And then you can say, okay, here, like entertainment media, he's currently interested in that, so let's show him that. Okay. <coughs> And um, so we were, we were able to pro process about 10,000 events per second on just one machine, which has like 16 gigabytes of RAM. Okay, so it's really not much. <sighs> Sorry. Um, we haven't even thought of, so you could even chart this very easily just by users, <coughs> but um, it hasn't been necessary so far. So with uh, one gigabyte of, uh, so with 16 gigabytes, you can um, track about 12 million like uh, single counts, which uh, already g gets you a lot of information about the most active users, those uh, which which you want to engage with. And I think this is really, um, so this is for us. It's always uh, uh, very, like I think it's very impressive, right? So you. So you're not sticking together stuff like from these different infrastructure parts, which you could also do. But even if you just say, okay, I just have a single machine, which, which also has advantages like you don't have to deal with this, with this distribution, with the networking overhead, uh, you can build something which I can actually pro process a series amount of data. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so recommendation. Recommendations are a bit more difficult, of course. So the basic idea is, so we are using this on a website called Zerian Junkies, which is a German website over TV shows. And the, the goal was that you, um, for one TV show, you want to see here in real time what are the uh, like related TV shows down here. So I mean, a recommendation is very hard, I know that, okay? But so the, the good thing about this specific approach was that there weren't so many items you could rec recommend from. Uh, from. There were only like 4,000 uh, TV shows in the database, and most of them, of course, are not... Uh, not active anymore. So it's, uh, I mean, recommendation gets very hard when you really have to recommend for millions of objects because the machine has no way to tell what is related to what because the data is so sparse. But in this case, if you have like a few thousand items, then like a normal collaborative filtering like approach works very well. Okay, and usually, um, so recommendation, like the basic entity in all of recommendation is this matrix here. So on this axis, you have users, so each row is a user, and these are items. And every time a user looks at a certain item, you, you put a one in here or you count it up or whatever. Okay? And then from this, you can actually compute the relationships between, like, the, which, if I have this item, which item to recommend based on the scores here by... Um, by summing up the information here. So you take this item and then you go up, you look at the users who has, have also looked at that item, and then you aggregate information like which other items have looked at. So it's, it's, like, uh, it's like what Amazon always says, right? So people who have bought this or have also bought this, they do something much more complicated in the back, but if you want to implement it, then this is it's, it's this, like that's the basic, uh, the simplest way of doing a recommendation. Okay, and normally you would do this, so first you have like all your log data, you construct this matrix, which is very big, like millions of users, thousands of items, and then you basically you have to do one big matrix, matrix multiplication, uh, and there are ways to do this in Hadoop very easily. But now the interesting thing is you can do the same thing uh, again in a streaming fashion using exactly these data structures if you don't do this, if you do it like online. So you store, the, so this is how you do it. You store this matrix as a sparse matrix, as a user item trend, and you store this matrix again as an item item trend, as I, as I described, you know, by having the, um, the coordinates and the count only in there and uh, no, no zero items. And then every time an event occurs, you actually, so if you, this user 
looks at this item, then you just do the update you know, along this line using um, the other items this user had looked at. So it's like, instead of you know, taking a, week, a month of data and looking how, how often like, all the items have been uh, used in relation to everyone, you just do this for each user just as he comes along. Right? And that way, you approximate like the real thing, again, the idea of approximation, in a way where you just have to do like, a finite amount of computation for each event. Uh, yeah. And the good thing is also that like, if you bring these, uh, these, these time, uh, time scales into account, then actually this, this matrix is changing all the time. So it, it's really a reflection of which user looked at which, which items in the last week. And if user behavior changes, then the, the whole matrix also changes. Right? And the same also for this side here. So you have a system uh, which is not, not only you know, doesn't require you to do these batches, but with, which still adapts over time and reacts in a very uh, quick way, fashion. So the, and the nice thing is also that it's actually, um, if you want to build this, it's actually quite easy because it's, it's really like when you, you put a bit of JavaScript on the web page, then when the web page loads, it sends the click event uh, via a REST call to Streamdrill, and then as a result already gets the recommendation, and then you just uh, render the recommendation. You can also, of course, seed uh, the recommender by sampling past clicks, so you just, you know, have, if you have lots of clicks, you just sample randomly from that and let it run for a time. Uh, as I said, it automatically adapts over time. Uh, yeah, and there are still many other things, so you, because trends are very easy to compute, yes, thank you, you can, um, uh, also, use all kinds of other information, like what are trending. Tr trending, if you would just you, you want to ma make a mix of um, like user-dependent recommendations, item-based recommendations, and trending items, you can also do that very easily because it's all it all and in the end breaks down to these data structures. Okay, <coughs> so uh, yeah, I hope the one thing you saw was that. Um, it doesn't always have to be scaling, right? So there are some applications, and I'm not saying this works for everything, uh, but there are important applications, I think, where it's not really necessary that you have the exact numbers, especially if you do like any kind of data analysis, which, which has a large margin of error anyway. Um, and if you go that direction, there are algorithms, these stream mining-based algorithms, uh, which at first look very simple because you say they're just counting, just counting counts. But actually, like in the way I described, you can use these to build data structures uh, to store all kinds of information and correlations between data, and you can query them quite effectively uh, and solve these problems. Like, and especially if you're so, if you're like as, as large as in the last talk, maybe then you have no way but really do it um, the, like the old way in a big cluster. But for, I think there are many, many applications where you have like a medium-sized we uh, website and you want to have recommendations, recommendations would add a lot, but you cannot really afford you know, to, buy, to, to buy or rent a Hadoop cluster with, with 10 nodes on there. And then this kind of thing can really get you a long way. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So, I think we have time for questions. Yeah. Um, does this type of recommender um, suffer from uh, self-fulfilling uh, prophecy? I mean, if uh, it, it recommends something and then the, uh, the recommended uh, object will be clicked more, yeah. is, is there this kind of uh, feedback? Or? Yeah, yes. But I think the, like all systems more or less suffer from that. So then it's more the question like, um, like uh, if you know that people clicked on a recommendation, you know, you should do it in a way that you can uh, distinguish between those clicks and other clicks and then not feed those back or something, right? So I haven't also talked about it. I mean, of course, you need to, you know, do the A-B testing and everything to see whether it works. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. There was one. So if I understand correctly, the, the way you parameterize your system is by uh, defining how many hash functions you have, right? 
to, um, to, to have more precision or not? Um, let me think. So it depends. Okay, now so for the um, for this heavy hitters, this top K algorithm, yeah, yes, there so are no yeah, hash functions. That's yeah. just the size of the table. For these count min sketches, there are two. There are the number of bins and the number of hash functions. Okay. So, but yeah, usually you would probably I don't know. Uh, there's a you have to look at the f there's a formula for the error, and then you have to look what it is. But there there's a way. How with like with two hash functions you can actually construct an arbitrary number of uh, of hash functions or of hash hash values you can use for that kind of algorithm, so that's not really a restriction. Okay, uh, is there a type of algorithms that you parameterize your system by the time of computation instead of the the use of memory? Okay. So for example, well, I I can accept two minutes, yeah. but it must be more precise. Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. So I mean, in a, in a way, right? As these data structures get larger, they also get a bit slower. Uh, but I think maybe you're thinking more like in a kind of like sampling or like yeah, iterative yeah, approximation, yeah. and then you you stop earlier if you say the time is out. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Ah. Yeah, I think there. I don't really know, but I think so. Like that would be like the kind of algorithms where you start a computation. And as the computation goes on, you're already constructing your result, right? And you could stop if you stop earlier. Then actually, there would be larger error. So you said, like, like, yeah, as I said, sampling kind of algorithms. So you don't, uh, you, you, you're not using this kind of uh, algorithms in, in stream drill. No, no, here, no, okay. no. Uh, okay. Um, here. Um, right here. I already have a mic. Hi. Um, how do you um, back up your data when you have your memory data structures? Yeah. How you make sure your system crashes? Um, do you sync it periodically to disk or yes, something? Yes, yeah, there. So In you what do system? <laughs> Sorry? In what system? Or just uh, the that could be anything. I mean, you could just put it on disk. So the, the good thing is so it's like, um, like it's, it's less than the amount of RAM you have, so the files are not really that big. So if you have like 16 or I don't know 10 gigabytes of RAM because of all the indices, and you wouldn't store this, you just store the raw data, then maybe you have like three gigabytes of data you can store, and then you would do this like I don't know once an hour, and then yeah. go back from there. Yeah, or you do like like a mass, uh, like a, you have two running in parallel, and one fades, then the other takes over, and then you can, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, could you tell us more on how you, right here. Ah, uh, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, could you tell us more on how you propagate these uh, changes in the user item matrix to the item item matrix in a localized manner? Like only partial changes to the item. Uh, you mean with the recommendation? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually it's like the... As I described, so what I mean, what the, like in the real thing, you also be, do a bit of normalization. So that you're, but it's basically like this. So when, when there is an event, you sort of uh, look at other users who have also looked at that, and then you extract like the things they also looked at, and then you just add them up. Is it? I mean, we can talk probably talk right. after the talk. Yeah. I think okay. It's maybe sure. Easier. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, actually, yeah, I remember that you referred to the good recommendations uh, as up to date and the ones that are already made based on the recent activities of yeah. the users. But uh, you know, it's a bit complicated because sometimes I am just uh, looking for coffee makers, but just for fun, see something on top of the page and about you know, like juicers or whatever, yeah. and just go there and browse something. But I am not really interested in juicers, and I don't need yeah. that. So. You know, it's it's a bit you know like uh, complicated things to see what what we have to recommend to users, and also if uh, if even you you make that based on the re the recent activities, but they they really want something else like some new things on their past behaviors. You know, it's I mean how how you can figure it out. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah it's always always yeah. difficult. Yeah. But I mean, one thing you could do here, you could have the recommendation running for different time scales, mm -hmm. right? And then you say like based on your Behavior over the last week. Mm -hmm. This is the thing which is probably interesting, and uh, or the like the user profiling. So you would 
Like if you're, you're looking at the juicer, you would see, okay, this is something you never looked at, but like right now there's a lot of activity there. But if you, if you stop, then it's, it's also something which decays very quickly, so it, it disappears very quickly. Okay, yeah. I Whereas mean, in yeah, like, or often it's like, right, so once yeah. it's in the database, then you're stuck with it for a week or so. Yeah. But I mean, in general, so if you really wanted a recommendation, mm -hmm. then I think you also have to look at the items themselves because there are some items you just like buy once a year uh, or, mm -hmm. or less, mm -hmm. and some you buy very often, and then yes. uh, I think that way you can, you can try to make it uh, more high quality recommendations, yeah. Yes, of course, yeah, yeah. So it's about more like dimensions that we are. We have to take it into account because bull.com also refers to good uh, recommendations like a most accurate ones or something like that. So I think we really need to fix, you know, what we need from the, the, in such context or uh, yeah. the website or systems. Yeah. So yeah, that was it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. I think one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, hi. In the last presentation, he talked about multi-factor recommendations, so yeah. that different kind of events would affect the uh, user profiles differently. Yeah. For instance, if you share an item on Facebook, or if you uh, oh, yeah. look mm -hmm. into the product for a long time, uh, if you buy it, if you just, you know, so you have different kind of events that affect the underlying recommendation model differently. Would, would your approach here at StreamDrill be able to handle multi-factor um, problems? Yeah, I mean, you can... And, uh, and how? I mean, you can, for example, you could have uh, different records, so... I mean, you can have different scores, like how important it is that you did something. Like, you could also have, like, two recommenders running, one looking at social activities and the other looking at that. Mm. And then in the end, you do a combination of those things, mm. right? So... Um, yeah, so you could write, say, okay, if there is something like based on your social behavior, something I would really recommend, then I do that, and I also do a mix of like the thing I think you would want to have based on what you clicked on on our website. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are infinite ways of, I mean, this is not something that's in there, so the thing that's in there is this basic thing I had here, so if you were to pro put it in production, then you um, yeah, would have to think about the different ways of using it and then integrating it in the, in the end. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you very much.